Hi, and welcome to the Church Unlimited podcast. Church Unlimited is a vibrant, Bible-based church in North Lakes, Queensland that is passionate about helping people discover the genuine love of Jesus. If you're currently looking for a home church, we would love for you to join us for Sunday worship. For more information about our Sunday service or to find out how we can best help you, head to our website at churchunlimited.com.au. We hope you enjoy this message from Sunday service. Well, as you would be aware, we're in our Taking Ground series, and we've been looking at the life of Abraham in Scripture. And Abraham is an interesting character because he kind of comes out of nowhere. We know a little bit about his dad in uh, Genesis 11, and then out of nowhere, it starts with God blessing Abraham. And God has said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make you great. I'm going to prosper you so much that through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And I just think that that is such an incredible declaration. What an incredible uh, blessing to hear that from God. And then did you know that in Galatians chapter 3, Paul actually tells us that that blessing is available to us. He says here in Galatians 3.14 that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Did you know that through Jesus Christ, not only are we born again, not only are we forgiven of our sins and restored in right relationship, but the blessing of Abraham is now available to us as the believer. And I'm challenged by that because I want to see the blessing of Abraham released in my life. I want to see God make me greater. I want to see God lift me up. I want to see God increase me. And we said a couple of weeks ago, you know, is, is, that, an, is that a selfish prayer? Is it selfish to pray for more? Is it selfish to pray that God would increase you? And the answer is yes. Yes, it is selfish if you're selfish. But if you're not selfish... If your heart isn't to have more stuff, more cars in the garage, if your heart is that through you, other people would be blessed, then it's a very noble prayer that God, you would increase my house, that my family could be a blessing to those around me. Can I encourage you to believe God for more, not not just more stuff, although I think it's okay to have a cheeky, sneaky desire, But, but what we're believing for is God increase me, favor me, have bless me, prosper me so that my life can make kingdom impact on the earth. And so I just want to encourage you. We've got to keep believing. This is why we've got our breakthrough taking ground cards and we're writing down the things that we're believing God for to be released in our lives. And there's a number of things I'm believing for, for our church and for our family and for my children and for you and And I want to encourage you, let's really go for it. Let's believe God for the greater things. We've been talking about how Abraham received the blessing through uh, a number of different things. We started by talking about how Abraham prospered through faith. By faith, he believed God. And so we were talking about how we need to see with eyes of faith. And we need to hear with ears of faith. And even our hearts need to be patient in faith. Don't, don't just give up. Just because God said it and then you didn't see it doesn't mean we, we just give up on it. Come on, let's keep believing for God to do greater things. And I was talking about how, you know, one of, one of our, uh, our women had come into church and God changed her life and restored her life and she got water baptized and it was so powerful. And she was coming to church. I didn't even know she had a partner. And then lo and behold, a couple of months later, her partner starts coming to church and He put his hand up and he got in the baptism pool and it was so cool. And I knew that she had been believing in her heart for the salvation of her partner. And I just think sometimes we just get discouraged and we've got to be careful that faith and patience anchor our hearts. And then we keep taking steps towards our faith goals. What are we stepping towards? I know that you know one of my good friends, he's just, bought a, he's just bought a business and he's stepping towards it. And I think he's a bit scared. And, and, and so should you be, because every time you do something great for God, it's scary. Um, if you're waiting for the fear to go away, you're going to be waiting forever. All right? That's, that's just, you know, it's not like when they went into the promised land that, oh, the man of God is here. And then all the giants left. 
No, they, they win in anyway. And, and I think it's, it's not, I would say this, it's not faith if there isn't fear. If you're not scared, it's probably not faith. And so you've got to keep stepping. And then we talked about surrendering. Come on, would you surrender? Sometimes I think we get really beholden to certain outcomes. And I've just learned with God that he doesn't always like to do things the way I want him to. And so I need to believe the Lord, but I also need to surrender the outcome of how it looks once he does what he's going to do. And sometimes we get a little beholden to, no, I want it to be like that, Lord. And I think God's ways are higher than our ways, and he knows better than us. And so to be surrendered before the Lord is so important, but by faith he prospered. Then Dan brought an awesome message to us last week about prospering through consecration. Abraham set himself apart. The word consecration literally means to set yourself apart. And Pastor Dan was talking about two things here. He was talking about that we're separate from the things of the world, but we're also separated unto the things of God. Yes, of course, we separate ourselves from the flesh and we separate ourselves from the, the ways of worldly society and we, 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 yes, okay, I'm, I'm going to abstain from certain things because that's not how I behave as a, as a follower of Jesus. But even more so that what I'm running after, I'm running after God's purposes. I'm setting myself unto the things of God that I will pursue him with all my life. And so in Genesis 12, we have God's blessing and Abraham believed God. And then in Genesis 13, we have Abraham consecrating. He sets himself apart. He separates himself relationally from his nephew Lot. He separates himself geographically from Sodom and Gomorrah. And he, and he goes up into the high mountain. And that's where he's pursuing the things of God. He also separated himself physically and spiritually as he went through circumcision to, as a de- declaration that he belongs to the Lord. And Dan let us know that now we can just be circumcised in our hearts, which is a a wonderful relief. And um, But Abraham lived separate to the ways of the world. And as he lived separate unto the Lord, God prospered him. He abounded. He flourished. Today, I want to keep going. And I want to talk about prospering through sacrificial giving. Prospering through sacrificial giving. In Genesis 12, he's blessed. In Genesis 13, he's consecrated. But in Genesis 14, something weird happens. After he separates himself from his nephew Lot, Lot goes into a town called Sodom. And he, Abraham, and his family go up into the mountains, into the high country. And Lot, down in Sodom, is overtaken and captured by the enemy. And out of nowhere... We, we see just this story of, of Lot co- taken captive, being in the wrong place. That'll get you bound up. You're, you're never going anywhere if you're in the wrong place. And, and then Abraham comes and delivers him. He gets him out of captivity. And then literally after that moment, we come to this passage here in Genesis 14, verse 18. And as you read this, it literally doesn't fit with the whole rest of the story. And yet God saw fit to put it in here. I want to read it to you. It says in verse 18, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And then random... And he gave him a tenth or a tithe of all. That is odd. Because there's no backstory to this. We don't even, this is the first time we hear of Melchizedek. This is the first time we hear of tithe. This is all so strange. And when you read it, it seems a little disjointed. And yet God specifically structures his word to teach us and instruct us. So in Genesis chapter 12, we have the blessing. In Genesis chapter 13, we have the consecration. But in Genesis 14, Abraham gives 10% or a tithe of all that he has unto the man of God. In this case, it's the high priest, Melchizedek. 
This is the first moment that tithe is even mentioned. Up until now, Abraham is living in the blessing. He's prospering. He de delivered Lot. He's doing well. But in response to the blessing and the favor of God on his life, he chooses by his own volition, on his own volition, to give 10% of all that he has to the high priest. Notice this. It's not God's idea. This is actually Abraham's idea. It wasn't God standing there going, okay, in order to get the blessing, you got to do this. It was Abraham's heart that understood that he was the blessed of God and that he was willing to set himself apart unto the Lord and do things God's way. And as he did that, he started to prosper and he started to flourish. And in response to the blessing and the prospering and the flourishing, he gives God sacrificially 10% of all that he has. Why does he do that? There's a couple of reasons. The first reason is he's basically saying, I was blessed by God. Everything I have came from God. So I'm going to trust more in the Lord than I am going to be trusting in my income. Sometimes we get so hung up on our own wage that we trust in the wage more than we trust in the Lord. The tithe was Abraham's way of consecrating himself and his money back unto God. Notice this. When Abraham consecrates himself, he consecrates himself relationally, separating himself from Lot. He consecrates himself geographically, not living in Sodom and Gomorrah. He consecrates his flesh with circumcision, he consecrates his son back to God. Remember? Remember when, when he got his miracle? His miracle wasn't that he would prosper. His miracle was actually a son. He wasn't holding on to money. He wanted a son. He wanted a son of promise. And so when he has his son, God says to him, okay, now I want you to give him back to me. Sacrifice him back to me. <laughs> what? Are you sick? What kind of God are you? Why would you say that? Well, let me tell you right now. At no point did Abraham, did God actually want Abraham to kill his son. At, at no point. God had always had a plan. A plan to provide a ram in the thicket. But in this, God is trying to ensure that Abraham keeps the Lord his God front and center. And his miracle doesn't become his blessing. He doesn't become God. It's so important that we start to see this. He has to set his son apart. He has to consecrate his son unto God. And I see so many people, we get wrapped up and it's all about the children. And I got to do everything for the children. And we become child centric. And we don't go on dates anymore because of the children. And we don't come to church anymore because of the children. And I don't read my Bible anymore because of the children. And I'm here to tell you right now, that God has not given you any blessing that will take him further away from you. He just won't. He won't give you a woman or a house or a job or a child that takes you further away from him. This is why in this moment, Abraham gets his beloved son, the son of promise, point one on the taking ground card. And he says, all right, mate. Will you give him back to me? And without even understanding, and without even knowing the outcome, Abraham makes a decision that says, yes, I will obey you, Lord. Abraham is understanding that not even his miracles replace the Lord God. Amen. Why is he tithing? He's tithing to say that my money my prospering, my blessing is separated unto the Lord. God didn't even have to ask him to do it. It was his free will that said, God, you have prospered me. You have blessed me. And here I am. I will give you a tenth. So why money? Well, there's a couple of reasons. A couple of reasons. The first one is money reveals my true heart. Money reveals my true heart. Jesus teaches us in Matthew 6, 21, 
where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Basically, how you spend your money is the telltale of the state of your heart. It's the state of your heart. It's important to ask the question, who has your heart? Or what has your heart? Does God have my heart? Does he have all of my heart? Or is my heart controlled by stuff? Is my heart controlled by fear? Is it controlled by money? In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You just can't. Mammon is not money. Mammon is the God of money. God will not play second to anything. This is the first commandment in, Genesis, in, uh, sorry, in Exodus when God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. He says, you will have no gods but the Lord your God. And so here we have a tithing moment where on his own volition... Abraham says, Lord, here's a tenth of all that I've got. I'm going to give you every tenth of everything I've got because I will not have stuff take your place. I'm not going to let my heart be in the blessing and not in the Lord. And so he makes a decision here. The tithe is a declaration that God is God and not me or my money or my stuff. People jokingly say that Australia is an atheistic country. Oh, yeah, it's... It's a pagan, atheistic country. Can I tell you, that's not true. We worship the God of mammon. We worship money. We do everything for money. We slave away for money. We will sell our families for money. We will stew and worry and fear about money. We chase money. We will do whatever we can do to get money. Money is the greatest Lord our God. This is why the Lord would set it up that giving sacrificially of our money tells our money who God really is. Money is such a controlling thing. And I don't think there's a problem with having money. I uh, think it's, uh, we're talking about having money. We're talking about prospering. We're talking about being blessed. We're just talking, uh, we're not talking about having money. We're talking about money not having us. Does that make sense? I don't have a problem with having stuff. I think it's great. If you drive a wonderful car or you're prospering or you're doing well, you are going to get nothing but cheers and acclamation from me because I think we are supposed to prosper and do well. But I don't think that we're supposed to let the stuff have our heart. So how do you know if something has control of you? The answer is simple. Can you give it away? Can you give it away? How do you know if the miracle son Isaac has control over Abraham? He could give it away. How do you know if blessing and money and prosperity has control over your heart? You can give it away. You can surrender it. Giving money actually breaks the hold that money has on me. In Deuteronomy 8.18, it says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant, which He swore to your fathers as it is this day. Let me tell you, I don't have to give. I need to give. Yeah, yeah, that's good. People ask me, oh, Pastor James, do I have to tithe? Is that like a law in the Old Testament? And I would tell you, no, you don't have to tithe. <laughs> have to implies that it's a commandment. And when we study scripture, there is no moment here in the life of Abraham where he's commanded to give. So no, we don't have to. But let me say this, we need to. 
I desperately need to give. I desperately need to be involved with the Taking Ground Advancement offering. Why? Because it reminds me. It's moments that says, Oi, Hensley, you are not the creator of wealth. Oi, Hensley, your house, your church, your wife, your kids, all the things that you have, they didn't come through your brilliance. They came through the blessing and the favor of God. And for me, giving is a massive way that I remind myself that every good and perfect thing that I have in my life has come from God. A couple of years ago, my daughter, Jemiah, she came to me and she said, Dad, we've got a really nice house. Might be nicer than most of my friends. And we have two new cars in the driveway and We get to go on cool holidays. Are we rich? And I said, that's a great question, baby. That's a great question. Are we rich? The answer is no, we're not rich. We're blessed. Let me explain to you the difference. Rich is where I am so financial. I have so much money. I have created so much wealth and and finance in my life that I can just go out and buy all the great things in my life. Blessed is when God supplies and provides for all of our needs. Baby, every amazing thing that we have in our life, from the marriage of your mommy and daddy, to our family, to our home, to our car, to our church, to everything we has a God story attached to it. I didn't just go down to the store and buy that. There was an amazing opportunity that God created things and brought us into his prosperity. We are not rich. I am not a self-made man. I am a God-made man. And everything that I have has come through the blessing and the prosperity of my heavenly father. I didn't earn it. I'm not so clever that I worked it all out. Everything in my life flows out of his blessing and his favor on me, and I need to remember it. Just a little while ago, we took communion. Why did we take communion? Because taking communion reminds me of the cross. It reminds me of the forgiveness of my sin, that while I was a sinner, Christ died for me. It reminds me of my salvation. Jesus says, take it, remember. The tithe? The tithe is just my way of saying, I remember that I am not, it's not James Jaira, James the provider. It's Jehovah Jaira. I am not the supplier. I am the, rem- I'm remembering. Oi, Hensley, remember. Oi, Hensley, remember. Everything in your life, your marriage, that's not because you're such an awesome husband. It's the grace of God. Your children, it's not because you're a model father. The grace of God. Your home, it's not because you're this and that. It's the grace of God. Every time I tithe, and we tithe every week, we tithe every week on everything that comes in, we give it away 10% of everything that comes into our house. We also do that as a church. Why? Because we're not sitting around living on your tithe. We're going to be generous and give and be a blessing to other churches and other ministries. And God is creating, we're not a a reservoir that holds and controls. God is moving and flowing in us and out of us. And as we live in that, that principle, God increases us. The second reason that we give is it establishes covenant. Listen to the language here. In Deuteronomy 8.18, You shall remember the Lord your God. Yes, okay, every time I give, I remind myself. For it is He who gives you the power to get wealth. So everything I have comes from Him. That He may establish His covenant, which He swore to your fathers, as it is this day. When we remember the Lord our God, when we remember that he's the one who gives us the power to get wealth, when we give sacrificially, covenant is established. God's promise is what he spoke over us. But how I behave and posture myself in response to his prospering blessing on my life establishes the covenant. Notice this. 
Genesis 12, God blesses Abraham. I'm going to bless you. So blessed that through you, everybody's going to be blessed. Then in Genesis 13, oi, consecrate yourself. Separate yourself. Do things my way. Follow me. Genesis 14, Abraham tithes sacrificially on his own volition, establishing the promise. Genesis 15, God promises him a son. He promises him Isaac. Genesis 21, Isaac is born and Isaac flourishes and Abraham's whole household and the lineage that came after Abraham was established in the earth as the Hebrew Israel people. What a phenomenal understanding when you understand that I am the blessed of the Lord and the blessing of the Lord is not conditional upon my giving. I don't give to get blessed. I am blessed. Why? Because he spoke it over my life. In return, I consecrate. I consecrate myself uh, uh, relationally. I consecrate myself geographically. I consecrate myself physically. I consecrate myself uh, with my family. I consecrate my finances as well unto the Lord to, to operate according to the biblical patterns that are outworked. This is why in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus says, Give, and it will be given unto you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It will be poured into your bosom. For the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. When I give, I establish the covenant. Oh, yes, the promise, the blessing is there. But it's my response to the blessing. It's my decree that says, Lord, I remember you. I surrender to you. I, whatever you have in my life is yours. My whole life is yours. Not just my money, my children. Not just my children, my marriage. Not just, not just my marriage, but the way that I live and behave and the way that I talk. I want my whole life to reflect your, your glory. And so people say to me, James, do I have to give? And the answer is no. No, you don't. We're not a church where we're going to go around and, and say, oh, where's your tithe? Where's your, where's your offering? We, we didn't see your offering card. Marianne? That's not how we operate. But we want a church. We want to lead a church that operates biblically. I have to operate biblically. I don't have to give, but I sure as heck need to give. I need to. My flesh, it's as rotten as yours. My flesh comes against me and I want these things and I get all excited about buying a motorbike or whatever my thing is. Just recently, I, I don't even fish, but I was all excited to go buy a fishing rod just recently. I didn't do it right. I went camping with the boys and saw rules set up and I was like, oh, I need to go buy more camp gear. No, no, no. Bring it down. My, I've got desires. I want stuff. And every time I give, it's my way of saying, hey, James, remember, remember the Lord your God. Remember the blessing, the favor, the promise that he's spoken over you. I will tithe. I will sacrifice. I will give. I will yield. I will lay it aside unto the Lord, not because he commanded me to, but because I choose to, because I love him. And I have been so blessed because of God. This is not just something that Paula and I preach. This is something that we do. This is a major, major part of our life. And let me tell you, the financial increase that we have seen in our lives has definitely been attributed to operating in this principle with the Lord. We uh, uh, give uh, our tithes every week. We, we don't actually give our tithes. That's weird. That's like giving back to God what was already His. So we don't give it. We return our tithes back to the Lord because it was His in the first place. But every year, as it comes to the advancement offering, we give sacrificially. In fact, for the last 20, well, we've been married 21 years, and for 21 years... We have been giving sacrificially. 
I'll never forget when we were at the advancement offering back in 2003. Some of you weren't even born in 2003. 2003. Thomas, were you born in 2003? Just. Just. In 2003, we were at the advancement offering at a conference, and God spoke to me on the opening night. Give your whole bank account. Sacrifice it. And I was like, Paula, I think, I think God's telling us to give our whole bank account. She goes, yeah, let's do it. I was like, whoa, calm down. Don't be so excited about this. I, I'm new to this, so I don't know how this works. Paula grew up in a great family where her parents taught her this from a young age. But for me, I didn't know. And I said, well, maybe we just test it. Because maybe it's not God. Maybe it's just, maybe it's the devil. Because, you know, the devil wants me to give money to the church. <laughs> That's how he operates, right? So we said, all right, let, let's just do 100 bucks tonight and we'll see how it works. So we gave 100 bucks. I went home disappointed. Because I was like, oh, I think I missed it. So we come back for night two of the conference, offering time. I said, Paula, what's God saying to you? She goes, did you give it all? I said, no, I only gave a hundred bucks. She goes, honey, you got to give it. So that night I gave 300 bucks. I couldn't sleep. And the last night we're at the conference and Paula goes, did you do it? I said, uh-huh. Before the session even started, I gave the rest of it. It was the first time in my life we'd ever, it was about $1,300. The first time where I'm 23, 24 years old, $1,300 is an is enormous amount of money for us at that time. And we were just, I was freaking out. But the thoughts of disobedience, I knew God had spoken to me. Well, within 12 months of that, God had brought us into a place where we stepped into full-time ministry God started to speak to me about my calling to be a pastor. I had done Bible college and I was, God started to promote me and elevate me on the other end of that amazing moment of faith. Just the next year in 2004, I was at a faith clinic with Dr. David Cartledge. Do any of you know Dr. David Cartledge? And he's, a, uh, he's an interesting character, and, um, but what a man of God. And I, we were in this clinic and he said, Hands up if you've never bought your first home. So hands up. Paula and I put our, 40 of us or so put our hands up. He said, come out the front. I'm like, oh gosh, shame. All the renters are coming out the front. All the poor people who can't afford to buy a house are standing in front of the church. While those that have houses are judging us. Wonderful. So we get up to the front of the and he goes, I prophesy within 12 months that you will buy your first home. And I'm sitting there going, what? That's so silly. You don't get specific with prophecies. Because what if it doesn't happen? He goes, this is what you got to do. You need to go home and find a real estate magazine. And you need to cut out the type of house you want to buy. Then you can put it on the fridge and pray for it every day. And then the third thing you need to do is you need to sow a generous offering. And I'm sitting there going, yep, there it is. Aussies are becoming Americans again. <laughs> Radio. So after church, we get in the car. And I go, can you believe that, Paula? I knew there was some angle. This bloke's trying to get more money out of us. And Paula goes, you're an idiot. We're going to get a house. <laughs> it's funny how two people can hear the same thing. If you have a bad heart, you think the bloke's trying to take from you. And if you have a heart of faith like Paula, she hears God's trying to release something to us. So we went home and in those days, all the real estate wasn't online. It was in the newspaper. And we're flicking through the newspaper trying to find the house that we want to buy. And, and we found this cool house. It was a three bedroom, one bath with air conditioning and a lock-up garage and a beautiful outdoor courtyard area. And it was listed by Elders Real Estate in Mackay. And we cut that one out and we put it up on the fridge. And then it was offering time. And we decided, it was mostly Paula and I was the passenger. <laughs> we decided to give $5,000 in the offering. 
I'm like, this is crazy. You're trying to get money, not lose it. What are we doing here? $5,000 goes in the offering. Within nine months, nine months, no joke, nine months, we buy a three-bedroom, one-bathroom, air-conditioned, outside courtyard area with a lock-up garage, sold to us by Rona Newton from Elders Real Estate. I'm like, different house than the clipping. But it was like, God's like, do you trust me or not? That was phenomenal. That was the moment I was like, okay, this is not just theory. That this is the truth. And I've got to hold on to the truth and not just treat it like it's a good idea or a book of suggestions. But this is God's ways. So I need to make His ways my ways. And so we bought Paradise Street. Can I suggest, if you have an opportunity to buy a house on Paradise Street, do it. In 2017, Paula and I were in a previous church and we were struggling. And we were like, ah, I don't know what God's doing with us. I lack direction. I don't know where we're going. And we come to advancement offering time. And I'm like, advancement offering, this is so inconvenient. Can I tell you, advancement offering is always at an inconvenient time. Because every day of the year is inconvenient to give money. <laughs> but in 2017, we're like the advancement offering. And I felt God tell us that we needed to do something audacious. We needed to give big in the offering. And Paul is like, well, we're not even going to stay in this church. What are we doing? We don't know where we're going. And we're like, we've got to obey. And so we gave big in the offering in 2017. And it was only four months later that God brought us here to lead this church. I didn't know that this would have been the fruit of my faith. You guys are my miracle. 2019, advancement offering time comes. And we're struggling. And I can know, I always know because I'm the pastor. I set it up. I know the date that it's going to (laughs) happen. We're one month out and we've just sold our house in Townsville on Payne Street. If you have the opportunity to buy a house on Payne Street, do not. Just as a word of warning, don't buy a house on Payne Street ever. This house was killing us. For seven months, it was vacant. We couldn't get a tenant in it. We were going under. I thought we were going to foreclose. I thought the bank was going to take the house. And we decided to make a rash decision to sell the house and we sold it at a $60,000 loss. So I owed ANZ Bank 60 grand. I had a 60,000 mortgage with no house. Bad idea. Don't do it. But for me, that was the more peaceful decision than dealing with the ongoing stress of trying to make the mortgage and pay rent with no tenant. And so we do this and it settles and we've got this debt for about two or three weeks and One of my family members calls me out of nowhere and he says, hey, I've heard that you sold a house upside down and you lost 60K. I'm like, maybe. (laughs) Did it happen or not? Yes, yes. Yeah, we, we screwed up. He goes, okay, I'll fix it tomorrow. You, you, excuse me? No, I'll fix it. I'll sort it out. I'll pay it out tomorrow. So the very next day, lo and behold, 60 grand comes in, wipes that debt. We're now three weeks out from Miracle Offering, and Paula and I are like, okay, we've scraped together $7,000. We need to give in this offering. But we also have so many other needs. What are we going to do? Do we do half and half? And Paula goes, let's go all in, and let's not make it seven, let's make it ten. I was like, babe, settle down. It's too much. She goes, no, we've got to trust God. We've got to sow. God's blessed us. So we give in the offering. Three days after the offering, the owner of our home calls us up. He says, hey, James, I need to let you know that my wife, Sally, has cancer. And it's not a good report. And we've got to sell the house you live in. And we'd really like you to buy it. So we stopped talking about the house. And we obviously were talking about Sally and their family. And we prayed. And it was, gee, it was hard. 
because that's she's actually now gone on to be with the Lord since. It was a hard time. But we came back to the house. I said, mate, would you know it? My $60,000 debt just got cleared literally three days ago. Actually, no, a month ago. And he goes, well, how about this? The house is worth $600,000. We'll sell it to you for $550,000. We will give you $50,000 equity straight up. All you have to do is come up with a deposit. I said, come up with a deposit? How are we going to do that? Because we needed another 50 for the deposit to go with it. And lo and behold, three months later, we were given 50 grand. No joke. And in a space of about four months, we went from minus 60 to owning our own home. It was a $160,000 turnaround. And we now live in a house that has increased incredibly with value. And we didn't put in a dollar. Actually, that's not true. We put in $10,000 in the offering. We sowed as a family to believe God for his increase and blessing in our lives. God has increased us time and time and time again. For 21 years, we've been doing this. We've given hundreds of thousands of dollars over the last 21 years. And God has increased our family. Can I tell you right now, I'm not just preaching principles. I'm not just telling you what you should do. Paula and I can't wait for the advancement offering next weekend. Why? Because every time God has exceeded us and he continues to establish us and expand us and advance us into the greater things that he has for us. We're now at a place where we're not playing defense with our money. We've been married for 21 years. For 18 years, we played defense with money. For the last three years, we're finally playing a little bit of offense. And it's easy to sit and go, oh, honey, we're comfortable. We don't need to, we don't need to go again. Oh, we're good. But the reality is, we are living in seasons that we have sown for. And now I have an opportunity to sow for my future seasons. And my future seasons might not even have anything to do with the Hensleys. My future seasons might have to do with you lot. It might have to do with my children. It might have to do with whatever God's going to do that I don't even know that he's going to do. But I need to keep sowing now for future seasons. I got to fight the urge, the, the desire to play it safe. Oh, mate, you did it last year. You did it the year before. Come on, have a year off. Surely it's okay to have a year off. To be honest with you, I'm not believing for less than I believe to get to this point. I'm believing for more. I'm believing for God. I'm getting to the stage in my life where my kids are probably going to start to look for partners and look for careers and callings. And my kids are going to start to leave the nest in the next while. And while. <laughs> and we need to sow for our future generations. It's so important that God brought us to a place of breakthrough. But now we need to help other people get into breakthrough. We've got to keep remembering it's the Lord, our God. He's the one who gives me the power to increase and get wealth. In Hebrews 11.6, it says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Did you know that he's not, ple he's not, ha he's not pleased with my house? I tell that story, it's a miracle for me. But God's not sitting in heaven going, Hey, Michael and Gabriel, look at Hensley's house. That's lame. God's not looking at my superannuation bank account going, oh, look what he's done. God's not pleased in stuff and security. He's pleased by faith. Because faith is a statement that says, I need you. I trust you. You are mine. You are my increase. You are the one that goes before me. You are the one that makes me stronger. And I've got to keep stepping out in faith. I've got to challenge myself year after year after year to keep stepping into the greater things that God has for my life. At the exact same time as we're believing for breakthrough, our church is believing for breakthrough. Many of you would be aware that we're uh, on the edge of buying some land here in North Lakes. 
The contracts are with the solicitors at the moment. The solicitor has looked over the contract and he said, it is good, except a couple of little things we just need to tweak in the contract. And then we're going to be putting pen to paper the moment that, that comes back from the, from the solicitor. And, and in this, we're believing God that God would continue to bring us as a church into greater territory, that we would be able to buy land and build a, a, our own place. Uh, we've got this block here. And I, I, I just, every time I see this picture, I just get so excited because I just go, man, that could be, that is just, that is awesome. If you don't know, um, this edge of the road over here is four meters higher than the back corner. So the sl it, it slopes four meters and it, it's actually perfect that we can put a car park underneath the building and we can actually make this place a lot more user friendly for us than what we currently have here. We're already starting to get tapped out here in this site. It's unbelievable. And that's a few years away, hopefully not too many years away. But as God keeps increasing us, we need to have our own permanent place. For the last 41 years, we've lived nomadic in rented facilities. But now is the time for us to start to apprehend something. Not just for us, but for our future generations. I am the 11th pastor of this church. In 41 years, I am the 11th. There's the first. I'm the 11th. But what if we got something established for the, for the 20th pastor? What if we saw something get built that was greater than us, that when we die, there's a legacy for people to keep finding Christ? Amen. I got thinking about the cost of this project. Let's pretend, and we're just working in round figures here, that between the land and, and the build, it's $10 million. We're going to build a building of hopefully 700 seats with room for another 300 children. We want to be able to hold 1,000 in this building. I got thinking about the 700 seats. What if you took 10 million and divided it by 700 seats? That means each seat is worth $15,000. I've got six people in my family. That's a lot of money. I, I, I probably couldn't do six seats at $15,000 this year. But what could I do over the next two or three years? How could God use me this year I'm believing, just so you know, our family is believing that through this project, the Hensleys will be able to buy our six seats in the new property. That's what we're believing God for. I don't know how that's going to happen. And so I was like, well, that bite is too big for right now. What's a bite that's in front of us? What could we bite off right now? And well, I thought, well, the, the land is 2.7. What if you divide that by 700? It's about $4,000. I was like, okay, $4,000. 4,000 times 6, oh. But did you know 4,000 times 6 is the exact figure that God told Paula and I to do this year before I had done all the math? And I just know that for us, we are all in. We are making big steps towards what God is doing in us. And as we come to this moment, this moment is is twofold because I'm believing for the increase in your life and in my life, but I'm also believing for the increase in our church. That as we continue to abound and prosper and go to the new next level, that our church would also go to the next level. Isn't it? It's no coincidence that through all of our giving and everything that we've done to this moment, that our church has grown so much as it has today. It was 80 people when we got here, Alan. But now you're here. We've sown for you to be here. We believe, God, that you would come and join us in what God's doing. Amen. And now is our opportunity to go again. Yeah. I want to read to you a scripture, a couple of scriptures. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6, it says, But I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Yeah. I'm not asking you to buy in to an obligation or a need. I'm asking you, would you let your heart hear from God and respond yeah, cheerfully? Because you want to, not because you have to. The other verse that I've been really holding on to is, 
Exodus 36. It says, Then Moses called Bezalel and Aholiab, and every gifted artisan in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, and everyone whose heart was stirred to come and do the work. They were building the tabernacle. We'd just done our tabernacle series. And they received from Moses all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of making the sanctuary. And they continued to bring him free will offerings every morning. There's two things that stand out to me. Everyone's heart was stirred and they brought free will offerings. They didn't bring, oh, this is a stupid thing that my church is doing and I've got to get on with it. No, they wanted to. Oh, Moses, this tabernacle is your idea. I didn't want anything to do with it. No, everyone's heart was stirred for it. And they responded out of a free will. I'm not trying to sucker you into something here. I'm trying to teach you what has been real and relevant in my life. And I'm hoping that we together could do something great for the kingdom of God. So here's a couple of questions I want to land with. The first one is, would you pray? But what kind of prayer? One lady said to me, James, I prayed and God didn't say anything, so I didn't do anything. I said, oh, okay, well, that sounds like the parable of the talents with the guy who did one talent and he did nothing. That didn't go well. This is the prayer that I would pray. God, I want to be involved. How would you have me be involved? How? That's a really important prayer. And then for Paula and I, this is how we think this through. So, so if, you, if you come here, what's the God figure? Does he give you a figure? Sometimes he speaks very clear to me, and that's awesome, and I obey. And other times, I ask this question, how much can we do? What's in our hand right now? How much could we budget? And how much could we believe to give over the next 12 months? So for Paula and I, we have a very considerable chunk of money right now in our bank account that we've been saving, and we're ready to give that next weekend. Can't wait. That's not a joke. I cannot wait. But we've also said, actually, if I look at our budget, there's probably 100 bucks a week in the budget that we could do another five grand if we just paid that 100 bucks a week off over the next 12 months. But then we said, actually, God always increases us it's not just what could we budget. It's actually what could, how could we prosper? How is God going to prosper us over the next 12 months? And we actually have said in our hearts with the Lord, we said, Lord, every dollar that comes in above and beyond our wages, we'll give you half. As you increase us and prosper us and believe to bless us, as we're blessed, we will give you half of the blessing. That's your increase on my life. I wouldn't have that if it wasn't for you. So I'll give you half of my blessing. By the way, this is in addition to our regular tithing. Now we're talking about sacrificial giving. This is how Paula and I do our offering every year. And we have watched God continue to increase us year after year after year. Once you get a figure, would you commit to filling out a pledge card? We do these pledge cards for a couple of reasons. The first one is it's actually really good for me as the pledger to put my name down and put my, I'm, I'm, I'm putting my name to this. I'm committing, my, the Hensleys are good for this. It's also really good for us as a church and our board, once we collect all these cards, to stop and go, all right, how much can we expect over the next 12 months or so? And for us as a church, you know, if it comes back a hundred grand, well, we might need to let this block of land go. Because a hundred grand's not gonna get it done. If it comes back 10 million, we'll start building the building next week. <laughs> that would be great, 15 each. Clarissa, you're good for it? No, <laughs> don't ever say my name again. <laughs> Would you make a pledge? Would you make a commitment with us? Some people don't like doing that. Some people go, oh, you should, your giving should be done in secret. Um, let me clarify that. It says your giving should be done in secret when you're giving to the poor as not to embarrass the poor. 
It doesn't say, Jesus actually stood at the back of the room with his disciples and judged people's offerings. We're not going to do that. When you make a pledge, some people say, well, what if I don't redeem my pledge? Well, let me tell you this. Once you submit this card, we're going to send you one email. That email is going to say, hey, we just want to confirm that your pledge is this. That's all we're going to do. And then after that moment, it's between you and God. Whether you redeem your pledge or not, that's between you and God. But we're just believing that as each one of us does our own part, God is going to continue to increase us. Then, here's the next one. Take some steps. Actually give. So on Monday, the 26th of August, Paula and I are going to give all the money that we had said that we're going to do right now. We're going to send that money. It's not theoretical. It's not good intentioned. We're going to do it. It's, yeah. it's coming out of my bank account and going into the land bank account. This is what it says here in first, 2 Corinthians 9. It says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supplies and multiplies the seed that you have sown. You actually did it. You didn't just write down a card. You did something about it. And increase the fruits of your righteousness while you'll be enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. He gives seed to the sower, not seed to the saver, not seed to the spender, to the sower. No farmer would ever reap a harvest and then leave their block of land empty. No, you go and you put more seed back in the ground. And as you're putting seed in the ground, there's a harvest. And so I want to encourage you, would you believe God that as you take steps, there will be the last thing, would you believe for a harvest? Come on, God's got greater things for you. He's got greater things for your kids. Come on, maybe you're, you're like that woman who's believing for her husband to come back to faith. Maybe you're believing for a child to come back to faith or a breakthrough in finances. Maybe you're believing to buy your first home. I'm believing with that with you. I want to see people be able to step into their own properties. That's, that would be phenomenal. What a testimony that you would not just be a renter, but God has greater things if you would just keep believing. Come on, we're going to get ready to finish. But as we do, would you stand to your feet? Scripture says that our giving establishes covenant with God. But did you know that God's giving established the, the covenant with us in the first place? In John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. Not, not one of His sons. He is one and only Son. He gave His best. That whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Through God's generosity towards us, He established a new covenant that we could be forgiven of our sins, that we could be restored in right relationship and we could come to heaven with him. Before we go tonight, I wonder if there would be anybody in the room that would say, you know what, James, I need to respond to Jesus today. We're talking about money, but really we're talking about hearts. Where's your heart? Is God the Lord of your life? Is Jesus the forgiver of your sin? If he is, phenomenal. That's great. Welcome to the family. But if he isn't, he tells us that if we pray and invite him in, he will hear us and respond. And so just before we go, I wonder if there are people that need to be included in a moment of prayer. Maybe you could just bow your heads just for a moment. Ask this of your heart. Is Jesus the Lord of my life? Is he the forgiver of my sin? Does he have my heart? If he does, awesome. But if he doesn't, we can fix that right now. All we have to do is pray. All we have to do is express our faith and say, Jesus, forgive me, wash me, clean me, help me to live for you. As we do that, I believe that he hears us and he will meet you in your moment. And so just before we go to lunch, is there anybody this morning that would say, James, I need to do that. I need to pray. I need to invite Jesus into my life. I need to know his forgiveness. I want to make him Lord of my life. 
Would there be one person this morning that says, yes, I need to do that? If that's you, would you give me a little wave? I'll see your hand and then you can put it back down again. I don't want to embarrass you, but I don't want to close this meeting without giving you that opportunity. You know it's you because your heart's racing. I've been here. I know. I've done this. Would there be one this morning? Okay. Okay. This is what I want you to do now. Would you grab your card in your hand? I want to pray over this. Don't sit down. We're going home. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that it is you who gives us the power to get wealth. We acknowledge you today and we remember, Lord, that everything that we have in our life has come through your blessing and your generosity. God, as the blessed of the Lord, we want to respond in generosity. Holy Spirit, we ask you to help us. Speak to us with clarity. Help husband and wife to be on the same page. Help us, God, to know how you would have us be involved. How are we to express faith? And God, I pray that faith would rise in our hearts and together as we just respond in obedience. God, you would continue to pour out. You would continue to bring increase both in our personal lives and in the life of Church Unlimited. Lord, we do believe you that we will be able to buy this land. We believe you, God, that we'll be able to put a building on it. Lord, we look to the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us. We pray that you and your family are richly blessed by the love and grace of Jesus. If you're ever in the area, we would love for you to join us for Sunday worship. 